Good morning. I started working at Netflix in 2010. Now, back then, the company was primarily a DVD company, subscription company for DVDs by mail. And the key data that was exciting at that point at Netflix were the movies and TV shows that people had ordered on their DVD subscription, the shows that were in their queue, and then how they had rated those movies and shows that they watched on a one to five star scale. Um, of course, things have changed quite a bit. These days, Netflix is a global streaming company offering entertainment on any internet-connected device all over the world in over 190 countries. When it had started, the streaming data was just this little baby on the side, batch processed, trying to mimic the DVD data, and um, quite immature compared to where it is today. Everything you see on the home screen is personalized, and personalization has been part of Netflix from the very beginning. And in fact, uh, when I started at Netflix, it was only about a year after the completion of the Netflix Prize competition. Some of you may have been uh, around or, or heard of this competition or even participated in this competition back then. It was a big deal. It was opened up to the public with a data set that everyone could work on, and a million-dollar prize was awarded to the winner who could beat Netflix's internal recommendation system that predicted the star ratings based on this data set. And so the winner had to beat the RMSE, the root mean squared error of that model, by 10% in order to win the million-dollar prize. It took two years. Now, what actually is just amazing to me is the number of submissions over that two-year period, 44,000, more than 44,000 unique ideas of how to solve that same problem with the same data set. That's incredible. And it really opened up um, a lot of opportunity um, for the community as well as within Netflix. Now, a little fact I learned yesterday that's super cool about this story that I didn't realize when I was putting these slides together is that the second place uh, uh, contenders for that prize that they inspired the invention of the first version of Apache Spark, 100 lines of code, and they came in second place because they were just 20 minutes late uh, compared to the first place. So there's a joke uh, apparently at Databricks around like, hey, 20 minutes sooner and they could have won that prize. <laughs> Um, okay, so the recommendation system is still a huge area of innovation in machine learning and AI at Netflix. Um, the streaming data alone, compared with that old DVD data, is so much richer, larger, and full of all sorts of signals you can extract, right? Now you know the context someone is in when they're watching, what device are they on, where are they? You know how long they spent watching a particular thing. Did they rewatch it? Um, all sorts of information that you can imagine uh, deriving really deep signals out of that data for, as inputs to the recommender system. The system doesn't use any demographics. It's really based on the viewing data primarily and other behavioral signals that we can glean from how people are using the service. And it's a big system. It's not just one algorithm. It's something like 10 or 12, varying over time, distinct models that come together to produce the recommendations that anyone would see on their home screen. Um, so it's a wonderful, exciting space for us. Now, um, what we do with all these ideas that are generated, because uh, again, we're essentially replicating the Netflix prize competition ongoing inside of Netflix these days is that a team will work on a particular model that they think might beat one of the algorithms that's part of the whole system. They'll work on that model, and then they'll, of course, assess that model offline. They're going to compare measures of fit of that model uh, with, the, uh, with the incumbent algorithm. And if it looks promising on metrics, things like if it's a ranking algorithm, maybe they're looking at MRR. Um, and so they'll compare that, and if it looks promising, we will run an experiment. And why do we run an experiment? Well, that's how we can learn the most important thing, which is, does this algorithm actually work for customers? Does it actually produce recommendations that help people find more movies and shows that they're going to love and uh, stay with Netflix for, for a longer period of time, which is the ultimate measure of customer satisfaction? So we'll run these experiments, and there are a lot of awesome applications, as those of you who are involved in experimentation know, just in the experimentation space, 
right? So there are all sorts of different ways you can construct experiments and run experiments, techniques like explore, exploit, um, in a continuous fashion experimentation, as well as things that are more um, A, B testing in a, in a more sort of a strict sense. So that's a super fun application for us. Now, since this is a big system that involves a lot of algorithms, and the algorithms involve techniques that are somewhat opaque, right, deep learning techniques, et cetera, it's tough as a human to understand what's the recommendation system doing. And we like to understand that for multiple reasons. One is so that we can generate other ideas on how to improve the system that are not only about the technique, but more about how all the techniques are working together. And then we also like to just, uh, I'll, I'll show you some other applications of how we use these clusters. But um, what I'm showing you here is an internal tool that we use at Netflix to try to understand essentially the job of the Netflix recommender system. And of course the job's pretty simple, right? It's using the same thing many of us use, people like this also like this. People who watch this also watch this. That's the general concept behind it. Of course, it's doing that at massive scale, and people's tastes are very complex. So conceptually, what it's doing is using these tastes, what we think of as taste clusters. And I want to show you a little more about this tool. And the tool lets you input one particular title, like this title, and then it'll help you understand the taste clusters of people who enjoy that title. Let's take a look at a clip here just so you have a feel for this title. Okay, how many of you would be excited to watch that title? Raise your hand, I can see a little bit. All right, a fair, a fair chunk, maybe 25% of the audience I think I saw. Um, all right, so if you think you would like that title, you might also like some of these titles. Not surprisingly, there are a lot of titles you see here that are extreme sports, uh, other driving sorts of titles. And so you might think naively, well, the re Netflix recommender system, if I watch one of those titles, it's going to recommend Formula One to me. And that might be true, but it might not because a different set of members who watch Formula One also watch these titles. And here you see a very different flavor. It's music titles and music documentaries, specifically rock and roll music, right, uh, which sort of makes sense when you think about potentially another set of people who would enjoy the Formula One show. And an even different set of members who enjoy Formula One watch these kinds of things. So here you see a lot of space uh, sorts of shows, science, documentaries, and uh, so you can start to see how nuanced the long, long tail of people who might enjoy Formula One is. And to drive that home a little more, Another way to think about the vastness of members' tastes around the world in entertainment is to understand how these taste clusters, if you represent them by row labels on the page, things like mind-bending comedies, uh, you can look at the frequency of those row labels in terms of how, frequent they're just, how frequently they're shown to members in their home screens. And this chart, I had to even chop off the tail. The tail is so very long. There are over 75,000 distinct row names uh, that are shown around the world in the product, which gives you a flavor for how diverse these tastes are. And at the head of the distribution are, of course, common genres like comedy or drama or action and adventure. And then as you go down the tail, you get into more nuanced and deep flavors of taste that people have. We're just fortunate that we have so much data from members around the world on so many different titles that we really can tease out these very, very detailed tastes. Now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about, okay, given that people have these really nuanced tastes, how does Netflix program a catalog that's gonna satisfy people's tastes all over the world? And how do we evolve that catalog over in time? And how can we use machine learning and data science to help? 
Well, it turns out that that same concept of taste clusters is super he helpful in planning the catalog, right? Because we can understand, we can summarize and interpret as humans what those tastes look like, and then we can program our catalog accordingly. We, can, we use this information to do things like understanding how tastes are changing over time. Are there new trends in, uh, in global tastes or even in certain countries where they're becoming more interested in certain types of content, and can we respond to that? And at a high level, we can decide how to allocate our massive content budget across these different categories of content. So that's super valuable to us as a business. Um, so internally at Netflix, the content organization and all the content executives who work with showrunners and other people to create these shows or to license shows, they're organized internally by different content area. So there's a whole team, for example, for documentaries who are working on the specific documentaries that we would want to produce or license at Netflix. So they have their budget, right? But now the big deal is, and where the money all comes into play, and also creating joy for members, is in really each specific title. How do we use data science to help with that long process of creating and making many, many, many decisions about each specific title? Let's drill into this by first taking a look at a, a trailer for this title. So, ¿Qué son apps? Pero tú vienes del monte. Ahora está por mi propia cuenta cientos de años lejos de mi tiempo. ¿Tú qué haces aquí? ¿Qué problema con ustedes los turistas que se creen los dueños de todo? Yo no tengo un oro para pagarle. ¿Oro? ¿Y esta de dónde salió? Ok, so this is a Colombian title. Uh, a local original title in Colombia. And if you're the team at Netflix working on this title, this might be like a two-year project, right? You're putting a lot, a lot of effort. You have teams of people trying to get to the point of producing and creating this title, and eventually it launches on Netflix. Um, one thing we've learned over time is really useful to us at Netflix, because there are so many human decisions, is to be able to tag the titles with very rich information so that we can understand what it's all about. Um, and so here you can see examples of some of the tags that have evolved at Netflix. There's a really intricate tagging system. There's even a job at Netflix called a tagger. <laughs> These people watch every single movie and TV show on Netflix and tag them consistently so that we have consistent ways to do things anywhere where there's the human to machine interface, such as members trying to look at their home page and be able to see organized titles with labels in the rows. Um, but these tags are also helpful to us early in the process when we're trying to understand the potential popularity of a title that hasn't even launched on Netflix yet. So this Colombian title launched in February on Netflix, but long before that, we had to start making decisions about this title. Uh, this chart is showing you on the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is predicted popularity of that title, as it progresses through time and eventually launches on the Netflix service. So there are many phases that happen before the title launches on Netflix. Uh, the yellow line is how the title actually did about a month after it launched on service. And so you can see the actual popularity of that title and how the predictive models did along the way. We've evolved this internal system of predictive models for all these phases before a title launches. And that system is now kind of like a cousin to the recommender system. It's big and beefy. It involves all the same deep kinds of machine learning techniques. It's harder to validate because we can't run experiments. And so you have to wait a while to get the actual popularity and look back and see how you're actually doing. And it has a lot of other interesting characteristics to it that create some really fun data science problems for us. But just to give an example of how these models are used and why they're so important to us, the first decision that has to get made is that vertical, first vertical line you see is a go, no go decision. Do we spend all this money on this title um, or not? And if that could be a decision about licensing the title or creating the title as an original. 
So we don't have a lot of data at that point, right? Pitches come in all shapes and sizes. Usually we have a script. We might have some talent attached to the project, like the director or an actor. Uh, and we might have some other information like the tags I just mentioned where we're earlier and earlier trying to tag with certain key tags that we think are important, important for predicting popularity. Um, so we can create a model there and, and you know, the accuracy is not as good as later in the process when we get more data. But critical decision nevertheless. Then there's this development and production phase. This is a long phase. This is where an original title is, goes into production. There are all sorts of decisions. It needs to be rounded out with talent, right? So if we, could, uh, if we could cast the right talent to make this title as successful as possible, maybe that's the right move. On the other hand, that talent is probably going to cost more money. So that trade-off of, of how much, what's the ROI on making different decisions during development and production, that's something we inform with these models. Then we have what we call the pre-launch phase. In this phase, Netflix is preparing all the assets. We need to localize the title in different languages, create subtitles or dubbed versions of the content. Um, we also start thinking about marketing the title. We create trailers, put the trailers on YouTube, and then that gives us more data as well as uh, an opportunity to think about how, how much of our marketing budget we want to spend on that particular title. Um, and then we launch the title, and then we get, obviously, much more data and much more accuracy uh, when we can actually get the viewing data. Um, okay, so lots of decisions that are supported through that system. Now, one thing that is a trend that I'm seeing um, in the data science field is the use of these advanced techniques and machine learning techniques that are sort of more opaque for decision-making situations by a human rather than the machine consuming the prediction, right? And in these situations, there are a lot of things to think about. First and foremost, what do you think happens when a Netflix content executive who has worked on that Always a Witch show sees a prediction from a black box model? <laughs> do you think they believe that prediction? First off, they always think their title is going to be more successful than it, than it actually is, pretty much to, to a person. Uh, they have a sense of what types of titles like that might do in terms of their popularity. But, they are very optimistic about their titles and they want their titles to be a success and they get that prediction, are they really going to use the prediction? So sometimes they don't and what we've learned is that if we can give them more information about what the model's doing, sometimes that'll actually generate new insights for them and help not only augment their decision but their creative process that they're using when the title is developing. So here's an example, a screenshot from an internal tool that lets them actually play what if games. I'm not showing you here what the prediction number was, so somewhere in the tool it says what the actual predicted popularity is. But then they can actually move the knobs of the different input signals, which are the rows here, to see how that would change the prediction. So live we're rerunning the predictions based on the inputs that they vary. Uh, and that gives them ideas, right? So if they input a different talent or a different production budget, they can see what that would do to the prediction, then they can make an educated decision about whether it's worth that investment um, and how much that would cost, say, if it's different talent. Uh, okay, so for a title like the one you saw a preview of, Always a Witch, that's, a, that's from one particular country, one of the most exciting things we're seeing is how well that content travels around the world. And so here's a, 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 a typical chart of what happens with a lot of these movies and shows that come from a different region. The first, each bar is a different region around the world, and the y-axis here is the percentage of members in that region who watch the title. And typically, the title is, mo is most popular in its region of origin, right? Not surprisingly. But what's exciting is how much that content travels. And this is very typical of most local titles like this, where actually they'll get much more viewing outside of their region of origin just because of the, the global scale of the Netflix platform. Um, okay, I'll just mention a few additional exciting things we're working on in machine learning. So one is what I mentioned about translation and needing to local localize these titles. Right now, Netflix has uh, titles available in 26 languages, which cover a lot, but there are thousands of languages around the world. Can we become more efficient at scaling our translation, our subtitling 
our dubbing even, you know, that's probably quite the big stretch, but the subtitling has a lot of potential to do some super cool things there that are gonna help a lot um, and really enable these titles to be enjoyed by more people who speak different languages. Um, the production space is a fascinating one. It's more of an operations research area of applications, but it's, it's massive uh, production scale of, of producing movies and shows all around the world. And so there are problems around scheduling that are really interesting, using space, using stage space, um, finding how to best optimize the creation of multiple titles across multiple stages, and all sorts of really um, fun stuff in there. Learning uh, signals from scripts. I mentioned the importance of this go, no go decision for Netflix, whether or not we should even start producing a new original title. Well, if we can get really great at um, understanding how to extract signals from scripts and other text corpora, that'll be really huge for us and it's, it's for sure an area of investment. And then um, we're super excited about uh, exploring people's tastes more. As I mentioned, we see evidence of people's tastes changing over time and expanding as people explore and get adventurous with the kinds of things that they'll try watching. And we uh, were interested in that both for existing content but different types of contents, such as the uh, Black Mirror Bandersnatch that Netflix launched um, in December, which is actually an interactive piece of content where you make a couple of selections and that drives uh, the part of the storyline you see next. And lastly, just really more and more empowerment of entertainment around the world, sharing stories from different cultures with different cultures. For me personally, it's the thing I'm the very most excited about um, in, at Netflix is that opportunity and why? Because I think it really helps build empathy around the world. If you can watch a story, which is a very innocuous way to understand a different culture, you're picking up on nuances about that culture, like how much violence is tolerated, what's a normal amount of affection that people give one another in relationships, uh, what's the level of cleanliness and san sanitization you know, in, in the different environments people are in, in their culture, how much are people suffering or how much are they joyous? And those kinds of things, I believe, really help people understand one another around the world, and I'm very, very excited about that part of the mission. Thank you.